also the question of uh, with with waging cyber war with developing smart weapons uh, there's always the question if we decide unilaterally not to develop these will other countries develop them and then at some point use them against us what what are your feelings yeah. about there, there's so there's an it's interesting that I think ethics uh, the advance of, of of AI and of machines making some of these decisions that are ethical decisions are, I think, going to be inter interesting sort of fodder for university courses and everything else, for example, I mean, the, in, the, in a self-driving car. The decisions that a driver is making, my God, you know, somebody's coming here, I have to turn off to the sidewalk, do I run over this one man versus going over and hitting a, a group of school children? It's an ethical <laughs> dilemma. Do we write that as code? Right. If you write it as code, now that gives us an, a, a chance to sort of debate that question. And, and, and then even in, in a court of law, you might say, is that the right code? And who wrote the code? Who, where did the responsibility for that decision lie? Um, those, I think, are, are, are really quite interesting questions that now we're, we'll start to address in, in more ordinary situations, whereas before they were only the subject of kings and, and things like that. Right. And Danny Hillis talks about the entanglement, as he terms it, an entanglement of, of people and hardware and, and software systems. And when I asked him specifically about this question, for instance, about, about uh, intelligent drones making decisions, who to who to uh, bomb and who not to bomb. He said that, well, it's not going to be an individual or a single machine making that decision, but a society making that decision. And the way that you talk about the society should discuss what the autonomous mm -hmm. vehicle should do when confronted with these mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. two, uh, two negative scenarios. So I guess the question there is, are there forums, is this being discussed at a societal level, or is that something that we have to set up? I, I think we're going to have to start setting that up. Um, I'm sure it's being talked in, in different circles, um, but particularly as the machines become more and more autonomous. I mean, we take drones, for example, today, which are largely piloted uh, by human beings. We know that um, that can be subject to jamming and everything else, so a way to defend against that is to use aut autonomous drones that are have a mission orientation and they don't need to be controlled once they're, they're let loose. Uh, you have the notion that there may be swarms of these that are communicating because they can provide greater intelligence and over a larger or field of view. And again, you'll have to um, try to write the rules and which is going to guide that behavior. One of the things that I do find um, not necessarily problematic, but, but sort of hard for us is that so much of AI today is it going towards neural nets, which was, was again, 30-year-old sort of technology, but advancing very rapidly again. And that's where it's harder to pinpoint the point of making a decision. Right. Why did you get a particular outcome? Well, the system was trained. But then how do you, uh, how do you guide that training? And if you want to insert other kinds of meta laws, you, you know, in this situation, do not do this. You need to be able to, to program them in, in some way. And we're moving into an age, I think, in, in which programs are less designed by humans than they are the result of training situations by neural nets and so forth. So is it possible, in retrospect, to look back and say, how was that neural net trained, or is that not possible beyond the we can we point. can we can certainly yes go backwards and say here are the here are the the cases over which this this set was won um that may be hard to recreate that exact set because when you're using something like training on all the cats on the internet that changes every second <laughs> um but but you don't necessarily know the logic that then that, that produced that result uh it's a series of weights changing uh, on connections and everything else but it's hard to so simply say this line of code change this if then clause to be something else. That's harder for us to do. Um, but I think that's where um, it'll be interesting from people who are writing code today. If we think about the programmers of tomorrow, 
are likely to be the trainers of tomorrow, not the programmers. Because the systems will be set up to be much more generic training, um, learning systems. And that now who sets up the training situations for those things, they will be imparting ethics. They will be imparting policy through the training of a negative or positive reinforcement for certain outcomes given a certain input. Yeah, and it seems like everyone I talk to say that says that that is the point which we should really be worried about right now before it becomes more and more established. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I, because um, we train our children. Right. And so we, so we hum, humans, we try to do the best we can by telling them this is right, this is wrong. There's a certain amount that they learn themselves by stumbling and falling or or touching a, a flame or something, but so much of that is actually trained, uh, and we're going to be starting to train systems. And to train a system, then you have to have an assumption that that system, in some way, thinks like you do. Otherwise, you don't know how to train it. Now, if an a, if if a program doesn't think at all like a human, mm -hmm. I'm not sure either the training would be particularly rigid. <laughs> Um, or it may come up with other answers. Some of, some of the things, even with a connection machine, we did with uh, genetic algorithms, and, mm -hmm. and Danny and I were working on one of these, which was a sorting program. And we, with a genetic algorithm, you start with a population of programs. And basically using kind of Darwinian selection, um, you let them mutate and try to solve the answer. And those that come close to the answer survive, those that don't get killed off, and they reproduce. And, and you ended up with a sorting algorithm. It was very hard to figure out how it came up with that algorithm. It was a pretty decent sorting algorithm that it, that it evolved, but it's very hard to say what exactly was it doing because traditionally we had developed sorting algorithms and they were based upon mathematical principles. You could prove them and everything else. This one was very different. Right. So. There's a lot of questions that came up here, and I think we'll need to come back and revisit them um, in, in more detail at some point. But um, uh, you've already told a little bit about what you think are the interesting things. What are you working on right now that, that is really exciting to you? Well, well, in many ways, I feel like I've drifted <laughs> downward <laughs> into um, again, trying to build a very, very large computer. This has been cloud computing. And this, uh, I was particularly struck by the fact that when we have um, the ability to offer up thousands of machines, uh, and Amazon was leading the way with, with AWS, making it available for anybody over the internet. So you no longer had to, to own your own computers, you could rent somebody else's. And you could rent it by the minute, by the hour. And that's a very different model. And you could rent thousands of them for just an hour. So before a university or the, the customers that we were selling to had to buy large machines, put them in place, and yes, now people could essentially, any student could do that sitting in a Starbucks with their credit card. <laughs> and that to me was exciting because that meant there was going to be more computing available to more people. Do you know roughly what year that started happening? When people could rent minutes on a supercomputer? It was, six, it was about 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh huh. Um, so around and 2006. Don't, yeah, I'm terrible on dates. Let's try to, con we can correct that um, if, I'm, if I'm off. But I think that that phenomena of renting computers, renting com computing time and storage uh, through the internet, um, means that there are many, many more people who are writing code today or have access to, to writing code. And that to me was very empowering. And so since that time, I've been uh, both at Sun Microsystems um, and at a company that actually did some semantic web work and then also now at Cisco, um, we've been building larger and larger clouds and finding the most efficient way to, to be able to offer those at a lower and lower price so people can do more and more things. And that means that now anybody can start to program those computers and they naturally start doing web scale computing, which means that you're not longer, you're, you're, you're never writing a program for one computer anymore. You're writing a, a program that will be spread over hundreds of computers and thousands of computers because you never know how, much, how either popular your service might be, how quickly it will grow, 
So you have this elastic nature of computing.